Welcome back, everyone, to Victor Road World Cup semifinals, sponsored by Elgato, Gigi Tour, and Metafi. I'm Yuki Zaninovich, and I'm joined here by Haiti McTavish. How's it going? Yeah, it's going great. I've I've been watching from the wings these other matches. They're so extraordinary. I'm a little jealous you got to cast such like extraordinarily explosive and interesting like technical play, a lot of momentum, uh, and I'm interested to sort of get to cast something a little bit different this time around with you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, hope there's going to be a lot of variety, right? We have seven matches today. They can't all go in the same, you know, tailwind, tailwind, <laughs> blah, 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 kind of thing. So uh, I'm really excited to see what kind of different uh, matchups happen. But I think the one thing that's going to stay consistent is that these are all going to be such high quality matches, right? Like, you know, these teams have all won six or seven, uh, you know, intense week of competition. Like, there's no way that we have any kind of like slackers left in the competition. Like, we just, we have like the, the cream of the crop here. And uh, I'm just excited to see what these players have to show for us. Yeah, absolutely. All the 14 players that you can see on the screen right now that we're about to see are phenomenal players. Um, many of them have extraordinary accomplishments outside of this, but also just the simple fact of being someone that your team trusts as the top seven players to play in this like super high stakes match against extraordinarily powerful teams is like in itself an extraordinary accolade. And every single ma one of these matches is going to be a treat. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I love that point you just made. Like, these teams, like, you know, everything is on the line. It's no longer in the group stage. Everything's single elimination. You just can't afford to lose anymore. So they just have to bring the best of their best. And that's what both of these teams said about their seven players. And now it's just a matchup of, like, okay, who's going to prove that they're going to correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so far, Canada doing a pretty good job of proving that they're correct. But uh, yeah. Australia still has some, some time to come back. Just a little bit of extra pressure on Ben and these other players, potentially. Um, if Ben loses, that brings Canada to match point already. And that would be such a tough spot for Australia. Whereas if you get that back, then you have a bit of momentum to try to come back from like starting out down two sets. And so definitely a really crucial match in terms of deciding the, the outcome of this seven game set. Yeah, you're right. I think that's what makes this competition so like riveting to me is that like it, they're all done chronologically rather than like simultaneously. Like if everyone just played the match at the same time, then it's like, okay, did you win? Did you lose? And it's like boom, all at once. And that's exciting in its own way, but in this way, like you know, people can change like their teams based on like whether they feel more confident now that they're up two zero down zero two. Um, so yeah, I think there's just way more pressure, and it makes it way more interesting for us. Maybe a little bit more nerve wracking for them. Uh, but it certainly puts on a great show. So I'm really excited to see this next matchup between Neil Patel and uh, Ben Madigan. Uh, like I just talked about in uh, just in this match before, uh, Ben Madigan is uh, one of the top players to have the uh, most amount of sets won. Has won, uh, you know, seven matches uh, just along uh, Henry Rich and Navjeet Joshi just topped that with eight sets won uh, across all of the competition. I mean, wow, talk about consistency. So... I'm curious to see if Ben will be able to, uh, you know, match that. Uh, you know, it's certainly a really competitive accolade. Yeah, just extraordinary to be able to have such a strong record against such incredibly fierce competition. At the same time, Neil did get to win, I believe, last week on stream. And so has a bit of momentum going forwards, whereas Ben is sort of recovering from a really close loss. And uh, both players definitely capable of like have demonstrated the fact that they're capable of winning under these pressure situations. And it really could be either player's game. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And, you know, Neil on one hand, like, you know, I think he started 2-3 in last year's World Cup and currently is 5-3, uh, has a way better record. So just kind of reiterating what you said, like, definitely has momentum going for it. Like, that psychological effect is really, really strong. So let's just dive right into the, uh, these two players' accomplishments. So um, I'll go off with Neil Patel over here. Uh, over on Canada's side, uh, we see that, you know, he's more of a newer player that also started uh, in the Sword Shield era, like many other players uh, who have just risen to the top very, very fast. Uh, you know, we see a couple top cuts in the uh, uh, um, top 32 in last year's uh, World Cup Open. Uh, we see a top 16 in the road to Frankfurt that was also hosted by Victory Road. Um, and then, you know, like we talked about, was a competitor in last year's World Cup. Absolutely. Ben Madigan on the other side. Uh, Players Cup 4, top 16. Players Cup 1, top 12. Extraordinary accomplishments in an online tournament setting that is really difficult. Oceania Internationals, top 64. Nothing to sneeze at. And Brisbane Regionals, top 16. So a ton of a mix of success in online and in-person events, which is a really strong accolade to bring into this situation. And clearly it's working for him with that 7-1 record, like we mentioned before. 
Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, like, I think, you know, you, you can tell that, like, Ben Magan has a bit of a, you know, a deeper history with the game he's been playing since 2015. Uh, you know, he has a lot of, you know, official records compared to uh, Neil on the other hand, but that doesn't really matter anymore. Like, they're both on the same stage in the top four of the World Cup. So, uh, you know, I really love highlighting both these players, like, in their past and, you know, what they've accomplished. But, like, now that they're here, uh, you know, that stuff kind of goes in the past. And it's just really about this matchup here that, uh, I'd say is a huge shocker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we saw we saw a ton of Tailwind in the last two games, and now there are six Trick Room users across both of these two teams. <laughs> um, we're seeing a Palkia Calyrex Ice Mirror, something that we don't often get to show, and there's going to be a lot of really interesting technical play to try to figure out who can edge out ahead in this situation where both teams have a lot of really bulky Trick Room users and five out of six Pokemon in common. Yeah, you're right. And uh, I, I really want to bring to light the uh, one Pokemon not in common, which is usually mm -hmm. a Tapu Fini. Um, I think this is, uh, oh man, this might be when I'm incorrect with my Pokemon history, but I believe maybe Bing Ji Wang was the one who might have come up with this composition. I don't want to be quoted on that one, but, you know, this team has been around for a really long time. It's been around since, like, February or something. Uh, you know, like, um, I believe uh, Megan Rattle, uh, she was able to get a second place at Brisbane Regionals with this, and uh, most notably, Paul Chua was able to get top four at the Region World Championships. So it's a really well-known composition. And I believe both times there was a Tapu Fini in the Regilecki or Grimmsnarl slot, respectively. And I think that's to kind of care for the Amoongus matchup uh, whenever your opponent, you know, they might be using Hyper Offense or, you know, definitely not a bulky team like this, but they have an Amoongus. Then it's a lot harder to go for Trick Room because that Amoongus is definitely slower than the Palkia, than the, you know, Calyrex Ice, unless you have like some room service item or something. So, uh, you know, it's a lot harder to get your Trick Room plan to go through if there's an Amoongus, but Tapu Fini kind of, uh, helps respect that because, you know, basically all you need to do is pivot it in once every five turns, and then the Amoongus, on the other hand, can't really do too much. So um, I'm really curious to know how these players kind of counteract Amoongus, and because we see Amoongus mirror match, among other mirror matches in Pokemon here, um, how they handle the Amoongus, because that really tends to slow the game down a lot. I really think you're right about the the Amoongus being the story of this match. So often that sixth slot is something like a Finny or maybe even a Tapu Koko, like something that stops sleep from happening. And instead, there's these two Pokemon that if they Dynamax and use their max move, they can stop sleep, but you have to commit that and then you're blocking your own Amoongus' sleep mode. But we're seeing coming out here, uh, none of the, oh. well, actually both of the Pokemon that aren't in common, <laughs> and then a Porygon 2 and a Palkia. I'm really glad about uh, how I was a little bit conservative with my commentary 30 seconds ago because I was about to say, well, both of these Pokemon are, you know, not as bulky as like, you know, Porygon and Moongus, like all the others. So I'm not sure if we're going to see the play, but off the bat, we see both of them come out. And yeah, I, I'm really curious to know what, like, what their thought process to bringing them out. Uh, Grimstone, I think, is a little bit more obvious to have a lot of support moves in the taunt that we see in the Porygon. So definitely no Trick Room coming out here. Um, and then we see the Regilecki go for a Volt Switch, wanting to pivot out before it takes any attacks, but we see an eject button, wow, I'm overwhelmed with information. <laughs> yeah, so getting that taunt off, extraordinary, one surprise from Grimmsnarl. The second surprise from Grimmsnarl, that eject button activating and something else is coming in. I, I believe the way this works is that if you Volt Switch into eject button, the Reggie Lucky doesn't get to leave the field. And so there's this whole yes. plan that Ben had of like, I will switch out to the best thing for this field. And now this Reggie Lucky stuck on the field. It doesn't want to be here probably. And and suddenly uh -oh. Neil gets the switch. <laughs> it's extraordinary. And the spatial end coming out. Possibly into that Reggie Lucky would be oh. really powerful. And that Reggie Lucky's gone. Wow. And yeah, I don't know if that critical hit mattered because we saw the life orb there, but I think this is really, really bad for Ben. Like, I really can't understate that. And I, the big reason is because when you have these mirror matches of really bulky teams, uh, very often does the game go into timer. Like, it's just really hard to knock out opposing Pokemon. And, uh, you know, I think one way to play it is to kind of just stall out the game, make sure the game tempo doesn't go against you uh, too much. And then the last, like, three minutes, when you see a three minute timer, you're like, okay, I'm gonna Dynamax, I'm gonna get a knockout on one Pokemon I chipped very, you know, intentionally and just kind of take the game from there. But now that Ben has this, you know, Pokemon deficit in the Regieleki, um, you know, he can't really go for that anymore. He really, really needs to turn on the Jets and just, you know, start getting some knockouts as well. Um, and that's probably exactly why he went for the Volt Switch, right? He wants to get some damage while pivoting out, and that that eject button just totally folded his plans. I'm I'm at a loss of words. 
<laughs> I, I am as well. That's I, I was not expecting to attack anything like that. And it's it really speaks to the power of Neil's preparation and insight into this team to come up with something so unconventional that totally changes this set. Like this should be a slow set in general and taking a KO turn one, as you mentioned, just so incredibly strong in this situation to be able to then know that you have the timer you can play to as a win condition a little more easily. But the last thing I want to call out is just that the Yuri Impulse didn't go off from the Porygon 2. So not oh, only yes, can it you. not set Trick Room and it can't use Recover, uh, it didn't stop the Palkia from having a huge amount of damage output here. And if the if Neil's Palkia is faster, suddenly the Palkia on Ben's side is in such a dire situation as we do see a Dynamax coming out, likely that Palkia. Right, and something I really want to point out in these mirror matches, and any mirror match really, is like how do these Pokemon train in speed, right? I think that just matters the most over any other stat. Like, if all of my Pokemon can move before all of your Pokemon, then it's just so much harder, right? So, uh, wow, and we see the Palkia on Mule's end is faster than Ben's, and oh, we nearly see the knockout being missed, uh, which is definitely fortunate for Ben, but uh, I don't know if he could have afforded that much damage to go out on the Palkia. Wow, uh, I... Impressive. I don't think I was aware that Falcon can just survive an attack um, of that magnitude, <laughs> and that is really useful. Um, but yeah, just getting that spatial run back and losing so much damage on another of your Pokemon when you're already way behind, when this Pal when this Porygon 2 can't do anything, and suddenly you're part hit by Parting Shot as well, um, definitely a tough situation. If there had been maybe a critical hit out of that spatial run, you might have gotten something. Um, but it's really an open question where Ben's damage is going to come out from here. As excited as I was that it survived, um, wasn't aware of that interaction, uh, it isn't maybe enough to really give Ben a route in, back into this game yet. He's going to have to find something else too. Right. I think the one thing I was going to say maybe is if Neil, you know, kind of misplayed there and brought in the Calyrex instead of that Grimmsnarl and, you know, got hit by a foul play, that could have been one out for Ben there. Uh, you know, kind of tying up the Pokemon count a little bit, but, uh, you know, Neil's playing very, very safe, very, very consistently, and brings out the Grim Snarl. Uh, you know, probably going for maybe one more support move before it gets knocked out, and yeah, I can definitely see Neil running away with this one. Uh, depending on what Ben has in the back, he might be able to have a Pokemon to Dynamax a little bit delayed and get that, you know, late Dynamax advantage. Yeah, definitely some options for late Dynamax advantages. That's always the the hidden challenge of using Dynamax that like you're not going to be able to use it later, but fake tears coming out into that Porygon 2, suddenly it has a vastly reduced special defense. This Wormwind is going to come into either Pokemon and do a ton of damage. It does finish off that Palkia, but now this Porygon 2 is trapped on the field at minus two special defense, and it can't use any status moves still from the taunt earlier. This Control right. is doing so much to manage this Porygon 2. Yeah, I mean, exactly right, and the foul play you know, it's not even like an ice beam where you can kind of fish for, you know, the 10% to get the freeze and come back into the game. So, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to say that this Pokemon would be a, a sitting duck of sorts. And uh, yeah, I think the Calyrex comes in for Ben and probably his last hope. Uh, unfortunately, Neil, still, we know that he has Incineroar in the back. So, uh, you know, can definitely mitigate the damage output from this Calyrex. I think if Ben is able to knock out this Grimmsnarl, or at least uh, you know position Porygon 2 so that the taunt is worn off by the time Grimmsnarl is not on the board anymore, then he can go for a Trick Room and you know go for uh, the Calyrex uh, Dynamax being faster in Trick Room than the Palkia. But uh, you know I have a feeling Neil probably won't let that be too easy for him. I'm um, definitely a phenomenal point that this Calyrex does have some options to really steamroll if it can get KOs at the right time with the right level of speed hey. control at the right moments, but. Super hard. Neil's been managing this game so well so far. Um, he can reset that taunt on the Porygon 2 if he wants. Can go for it on the, well, on the Calyrex to stop a max guard. Probably not going to happen as we do see that Calyrex go for a Dynamax. Going to try to just start with damage right now and see if you can flip that game around um, because this Porygon 2 is really just not in a strong position. Uh, it's not necessarily going to be able to do much more than foul play into Pokemon and, and faint, as you said, the sitting duck. Um, yeah. Calyrex is not going to be able to go early though and the big tears if that's into the calyrex um is going to be able to oh well into the porygon 2 lowering that special defense a little bit more and the wormwind uh is going into the porygon 2 um picks up the ko uh, in a single hit this porygon 2 has built itself to be bulky and it doesn't work um we did see i believe the item on the calyrex is the white herb so it's able to not get that attack drop but with just a calyrex and nothing else on the field with an incineroar in the back um, Ben's going to have an extraordinarily difficult time closing this out. Oh, and maybe a critical hit there could have run back into the game, but alas, 
even the you know the luck is just not on Ben's side in this first game, and we see the hail chip come out onto the Grim Snarls to conclude the game, or sorry, to conclude the turn. And yeah, it's Calyrex versus the world, and uh, you know, as much of a Pokemon with the you know the chewing a uh, boosts, being able to potentially run away with the game at times, uh, I think the deficit is a little bit too big. Yeah, well said. I think it's the end of the turn and also very close to the end of the game. Uh, we've seen that the Grim Snarl has fake tears, so this Palkia can do a ton of damage into the Calyrex. Technically might not have a 100% accurate move to do so, so maybe there's some slim chance of a way out. But uh, especially with Incineroar we've seen it in the back. Uh, and if you have, if Neil has a Calyrex of his own that can come in later, um, it would be... Calyrex is capable of flipping games around, yes. but yes. I, it would be tough. Certainly, certainly. Uh, we, especially with these fake tiers, just you know, making Palkia's attacks that much stronger. And yeah, the the inaccurate move that you just talked about. I think we just saw that the Palkia re uh, revealed the very accurate move that does a lot of damage uh, to the Calyrex. And yeah, it's it's not looking promising. But the one thing I do want to point out is that uh, you know, Neil's in a really commanding position right now, but he is revealing a lot of information. Uh, you know, Flamethrower is not a really uh, common move on Palkia. I think a lot of players definitely use it so that, uh, you know, their team doesn't instantly fold to a Shedinja, uh, especially since, you know, maybe Incineroar might be the Pokemon that can really damage it sometimes. So, um, you know, Flamethrower, not the most uncommon move, but Fake Tears on Grim Snarl, uh, especially in the Series 12 format, definitely very uncommon. So I think the information gain over on Ben's side is uh, pretty, pretty massive. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think he provided that much information other than the Regilecki having the Life Orb. I think that was the only really unconventional pick that he revealed. So I think from an information uh, perspective, Ben is definitely, uh, you know, has the upper hand from this match, so he might be able to adjust uh, a little bit better. I think that's a brilliant point, Yuki. I, we've been talking about this as in terms of can Ben bring the game back, but the question is also, can Ben keep the game close enough that Neil has to continue revealing yes. information yes. about this matchup? So that Ben can then potentially win game two and game three. And that is what's happening. Having to reveal that flamethrower, not to risk misses. Um, Foul Play coming out. Also, I think a new reveal and Flare Blitz to close out that game. So now um, Grimmsnarl's, the surprise of Grimmsnarl really did decide this first game almost completely. And that surprise is gone now. So what will Ben do to adjust is the question. Yeah, definitely. So we see the game being closed out. Um, yeah, lots of surprises from Neil. I think, you know, there's definitely an aspect where Neil was able to run away with the fact that that first turn, Banana's interaction just, you know, led to Reggie Lecky fainting from turn one. If that didn't happen, I think, you know, the Reggie Lecky might be able to come back in a later turn. You see a chipped Palky, you see a chipped Calyrex Ice, and maybe it will just, you know, max lightning them all away um, and kind of kind of reverse sweep in a, in a way. But uh, the fact that I got knocked out turn one, and then, uh, you know, the fact that Palkia is faster um, on Neil's end that just spelled uh, disaster um, over for Ben's end. And yeah, I think what I'm most curious about is how is Ben going to uh, weather the attacks coming out from Neil's Palkia? Because I feel like usually in these mirror matches, you really leverage your Tapu Fini, not only for the Misty Terrain to prevent the Amoongus Spores, but also for the Misty Terrain secondary effect, which is often overlooked, the having of the dragon type damage. And that means, you know, you can mitigate Palkia's damage output. You also force the opponent to not be able to click Max Wormwind that easily because if you bring it into a Tapu Fini switch in, you just waste one turn of Dynamax. So uh, because he can't really do that anymore with the lack of Tapu Fini and the fact that Neil's Palkia is a lot faster, I think he's kind of a disadvantage in that perspective. But uh, because his team is so bulky, I think he can definitely, uh, you know, kind of stall it out. So I'm curious to see how that goes. Yeah, I think that's a, a brilliant point. The Tepo Fini is such a crucial piece of handling that mirror, and neither player has chosen to bring it. And so suddenly there is this question of how will the Palkias interact? Um, the Grimmsnarl was just ridiculous in that first game. It effectively stopped both Pokemon from Ben's side from doing what they wanted to do that turn. Yeah, it, right, it, and right. It <laughs> like, that's just everything you could possibly want for in a Pokemon. You got Incineroar in, in place of it and stopped them. Um, but we do now know, I think, probably the full moveset, because we've seen Taunt, Fake Tears, Foul Play. It's holding an eject button, and I'd be extraordinarily surprised if it doesn't have Trick as an option to stop Dynamax. Um, and then with the Palkia being faster, too, than everything except that Regilecki, um, I, I believe, based on what we've seen so far, um, there's just so many options without that type of Finny as an option. Uh, Dragon's mm -hmm. just good into, I think, like the whole of Ben's whole team. team. Yeah. And so you've got that powerful Dynamax Pokemon, um, 
there's only one Pokemon that outspeeds it. Um, we And you've already confirmed, like, oh, okay, I won't get a knockout on the other Palkia, so I'll have to be careful to chip it just a little bit to make sure. Right, exactly. Um, I think when we were, before we were getting ready to cast this match, we were saying, oh, you know, is this going to be like, you know, the Oceana finals where it was Stack Attack versus Stack Attack? Uh, you know, I think we really need to think of what we can do to, you know, go through the, the turns of, you know, Porygon 2 versus Porygon 2, but... I'm not really sure that's going to happen anymore. Like, I mean, Neil's team is so much more offensive than we had even imagined, right? Like, it's just the Palkia is faster than Ben's Palkia, and the fact that the Grim Snarl just has the fake tears just really puts a dent in Ben's usual game plan, which is just to be bulky and outlast the opponent. So, um, you know, I think it's really, um, you know, Ben's game to lose here. Like, he, like he's I clearly at a disadvantage, in my opinion, in terms of just the team composition. So um, I think he just needs to get really creative to do the adaptation, uh, to get rid of the Grim Snarl before there's too many fake tears. Um, and I'm just really excited to, to see that. And, you know, he's not winning, you know, seven sets in this, you know, really competitive competition for no reason. He must have, uh, you know, just a plan in these game best of threes. So uh, you know, I think we can definitely rely on him to uh, really mix it up for us. Yeah, absolutely. Ben, a player who can certainly handle being on the back foot. Um, but something I do want to call out, like what you said, the the team matchups being so skewed. I'm not sure if this was a counter team or just how things happen to play out. Mm -hmm. but if it were a counter team, that's such an extraordinary take on a counter team. That Grimstar works so well. And then having a near mirror where your Pokemon are faster is such a strong advantage too. I was just really impressed with the prep that Neil did going into this match. Yes, but yes. Moving sorry, into I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, just going to move into the lead, not talk too long about the excitement of the team preview. Um, Incineroar is coming out and the Reggie Lucky from Ben. That's the adjustment we're seeing, but now we've got the, the tried and true lead, Amoongus and Palkia. We know that the Palkia is strong against everything except that Reggie Lucky, and now the Amoongus is here to redirect the attacks. Yeah, tried and true indeed. I mean, you know, Palkia Pokemon have very little, uh, you know, like, you know, attacks that can knock out one hit, and Amoongus especially has the Focus Sash basically impossible to knock out one hit. So uh, very reliable in most matchups. Um, and, you know, especially here to, um, I think the really obvious, you know, at first sight kind of um, play for Ben could be to fake out the Amoongus so it can't redirect any of Reggie Lucky's attack. And it could go for, you know, a, you know, uh, a Max Lightning. Might be able to pick up a Palkia um, if it doesn't uh, Dynamax itself. But uh, we see no Dynamax coming out, maybe going for a Volt Switch play. Yeah, um, uh, Amoongus is not losing a Focus Session, that's what it had. Fake it going into that Protect. Reggie Lucky not going for the Dynamax though, maybe a bit nervous about how that would play out, and just doing a Volt Switch, getting a lot of damage into that Palkia, which is important. And this time, this time Reggie Lucky Volt Switched correctly, and it gets to leave the field and not change yes. on turn one. <laughs> and so it can come in later and, and threaten this Palkia. Um, but Palkia does have a chance to retaliate now into either this Calyrex or this Incineroar, or it could even set Trick Room if, if you want to play into this Amoongus. Um, we're going to see after the many abilities activated from Calyrex. Palkia does go for Trick Room, so this Amoongus is in a phenomenal position now. Yeah, I think there's a great play from uh, Ben to not go for the Dynamax on Reggie Lecky. Based on uh, the damage we just saw, you know, Volt does exactly half compared to Max Lightning, so, uh, you know, if the same damage roll had happened there, then the Palkia would have certainly survived that and would have basically wasted the, the Dynamax. But uh, we see Neil go for a totally different strategy than Game 1, right? Like, he set the Trick Room, uh, which is a lot slower than what he went for in... Um, game one, especially when the Palkia we know is faster over on his end. But it sounds like he just wants to, you know, make sure the Amoongus is going to shine a lot more, which I think we talked about because there's no Tapu Fino on either team. Yeah, playing to that Amoongus game two after seeing Ben didn't bring Amoongus game one seems like such a strong adjustment. Uh, we are now going to see that Palkia pivot out. Uh, it doesn't need to do anything more than set Trick Room. And Sinra is burning that White Herb on Calyrex, so you have some options later. Or going into that Calyrex, keeping it from attacking this first turn because you do not want to take Glacial Lances. Uh, and now Ben's Incineroar is going to have a chance to do, I believe we saw it going for that parting shot. Um, so it's going to be able to do that. But into an Incineroar, uh, not quite the leverage you want to get, um, just getting a chance to pivot out. Right. And uh, I think rest of, we probably won't be seeing the Regilecki come in, uh, knowing how frail it is and how uh, it probably doesn't shine too much in the Trick Room environment. Um, and yeah, I think this, this Amoongus is looking really, really strong, especially since we see the uh, fourth Pokemon revealed over on Ben's side, being the Palkia, not the Amoongus. Uh, you know, there's just nothing that's immune to the Amoongus' spore, barring any safety goggles items. So, uh, you know, especially the, um, the Incineroar over on Ben's side, we didn't see the items, so it's possible that it has the safety goggles. That's something that Neil might be able to respect, but otherwise, yeah, I think this Amoongus is in a very dominant position. 
Yeah, I'm moving in a dominant position. The not using max lightning on turn one and Neil calling that really setting Ben on the back foot because this Amoongus has many turns of trick room to just keep firing off that sleep. Um, Incineroar does get to come in. Um, Spore going into that Palkia, but you get to burn a turn of that sleep when Palkia is not too threatened. I guess that's something. If you can wake up quickly, Ben still definitely has a route back into this match. And Parting Shot doing into the other Incineroar this time um, uh, and getting something else back in. Uh, potentially, r really anything that can leverage this momentum that this Amoongus is building for its team uh, with Spore. Um, it looks like it's going to be that Calyrex. Right. And uh, this Incineroar still yet to move. Uh, curious if it goes for a Flare Blitz, maybe calling that this Incineroar might go for a Parting Shot instead of an attack. Uh, that would definitely make things interesting. Oh, sorry, it just switched in this turn, so I can't really do that. Um, so, yeah, I think this turn is the first time where Neo might be able to go more on the offense. He didn't really have a Pokemon that can uh, have that kind of damage output next to the Amoongus, but now he's threatening a Spore on the Incineroar slot while also a threatening attack coming out from the Calyrex. So, you know, he might be able to go for some, uh, you know, really cheap incremental damage with, uh, you know, Glacial Lance. I think he doesn't need to feel any kind of a rush to Dynamax yet and just slowly just, you know, use the, the, the sleep to his advantage to basically protect the Calyrex from taking damage as it goes for uh, the Glacial Lances, slowly chipping away at Ben's uh, Pokemon, especially since we don't see the Porygon or the Amoongus um, on Ben's side. I think all damage will be permanent. There is no you know, Pollen Puff, Regenerator, uh, Recover action happening. Yeah, the, the, the permanent damage is such a brilliant point to bring up here. It definitely means that now that Neil can start doing damage with this Amoongus for support, um, that's going to go a really long way towards using these last couple turns of Trick Room. We do see Calyrex Dynamaxing, um, deciding to go a little bit more dramatically for damage, maybe wanting to make sure Fake Out can't slow it down, um, and is going to be able to get some Dynamax attacks off. I believe we saw that Ben went for Fake Out into the other slot, so it's going to go into that Amoongus, and suddenly the Amoongus isn't able to put anything more to sleep. Um, Max Quake coming out is going to protect this Calyrex though, even if the Palkia wakes up right away. Um, oh, and the Incineroar survives on one hit point, uh, so it's around to still do stuff. Uh, a Focus Sash? Wow, such ah. interesting item text uh, from both of these players in terms of trying to handle this matchup. That Incineroar staying around is a huge deal if this Palkia wakes up, but it does not. And so this Calyrex is able to keep putting out that pressure, but crucially without getting rid of the Incineroar and putting Ben even more behind. Right, yeah, I, I really appreciate the innovation of uh, Focus Sash and Incineroar. That's really not something we've seen in Incineroar in past generations. Um, and even in really past movesets, uh, I think the Incineroar Focus Sash kind of respects the Kyogre matchup. The fact that you can, you know, lead Incineroar Palkia and go for a fake out um, into, uh, you know, the Zacian so that it can't, you know, pick up your Palkia and take the Water Spout. That means you still don't, uh, you know, you don't lose a Pokemon to just fake out instead of Trick Room. So I like that a lot. And uh, yeah, proving clutch for him in this scenario as well. Uh, the Max Quake doesn't get a free uh, knockout for Neil, and that means that you know that's just one more Dynamax turn that he's able to uh, you know lose a Pokemon to. So we see Ben go for Dynamax here, which is interesting because I don't believe it's used up all of its sleep turns uh, necessarily. Um, you know, it could still have one more extra turn of sleep, and that would just be disastrous for him. So definitely taking a gamble, but I really like that because he's in a disadvantage, and I think he just figures that he needs to go for this kind of risky play in order to stay in this game. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely telling that Ben is a little bit on the back foot, needing to go for Dynamax on a Pokemon and hope it wakes up. Uh, Max Quake coming into it. Um, having that Dynamax is definitely nice so that you don't take quite so much damage here. Uh, but the crucial piece is that special defense boost on both of the Pokemon on Neil's side of the field. Even if this Palkia wakes up, unless it's getting a critical hit, it might not be doing enough damage to really push things around. And oh. it gets the three turn sleep, just not the luck that Ben needed to pull himself back into this game. Right. And, well, so I think definitely Ben has a silver lining here. Um, mm -hmm. The fact is that, like, you know, we've seen that his Palkia is slower than Neo's Palkia, but the fact that is that the way this game turned out, Neo used his own Dynamax on the uh, Calyrex instead of mm -hmm. his own Palkia. So uh, he's actually now in a situation where uh, he can take a Spatial Ren from uh, Neo's Palkia and uh, in return be able to knock it out with a Max Wormwind. So uh, if he's able to stall this out well enough, uh, I think he definitely has the... Uh, you know, the speed advantage in this current turn at least, uh, but both of those Pokemon are asleep. So I think he might need to rely on luck a little bit, uh, but he has the guaranteed wake up here. Yeah, the guaranteed wake up on that Palkia, get a max Wormwind off, get to lower that attack of the Calyrex and get a little bit of damage to this Moongus, which is causing a huge problem. This Calyrex could wake up too, and that would be phenomenal yes. for Ben. If you start with two sleeping Pokemon and they both wake up, that's really something. 
Uh, the other Calyrex is going to get to move first. Neil is going to be able to get off a nice Max Quake into his Calyrex, just getting a little bit of damage. That Max Run Wind going a long way to reduce it. And the crucial question here is, okay, I got a three-turn sleep on Palkia. Can can Calyrex get a one-turn sleep? Oh. And it does! Oh! So starting with both Pokemon asleep at the start of this turn, but neither Pokemon not being able to move, and getting rid of that Amoongus that has just terrorized this field the whole way through because of that difficulty that Amoongus was going for sleep for a long time, but the Pokemon had a chance to burn those turns of sleep, and suddenly they're awake. Right, and uh, I was so, you know, just invested in seeing if this Calyrex would wake up that <laughs> I didn't know which uh, where the Max Quake went, but I believe it went into the Calyrex, and in that yes. case, I think this Palkia is still capable of taking, uh, you know, spatial runs coming out from Neil's Palkia if he decided to bring it. And in that case, uh, you know, I think Ben is still really an advantage. Like, nothing can really knock out this Palkia in one hit. So, uh, you know, as as grim as it looked, uh, you know, with that really clutch wake up from the Calyrex, he's definitely still in this game. Uh, I think the one thing he needs to get right this turn is whether this Incineroar will go for an attack or is it going to switch out into his Palkia to try to waste a Max Geyser into that slot. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's also, I suppose, the gamble of, like, what fake out, will it try to do something else? Um, and, and yeah, getting a Max Geyser into this Incineroar, phenomenal, but then there is still so much pressure on this Cal um, on this Calyrex if you burn that Max turn and then Incineroar's in the back to come in later, and suddenly mm. this Palkia can't threaten it anymore or has to rely on Hydro Pump. Uh, definitely a, a tough spot, and there's a lot of pressure on Ben to make a good read. Right, right. So we don't see any switch outs happening, so uh, did Ben make the correct read with a Max Geyser? Yes, he does! So unless we see any kind of focus Nash shenanigans happen, over on his Incineroar. Oh, I think it is! It's another Focus Ash. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, yeah, that's. it sounds like both these teams are using the same kind of compositions. We see a Glacial Lance uh, coming out over from uh, Neil's end and just finishing up the turn. Uh, of course, Calyrex uh, faint, uh, flinched and is not able to move. So uh, yeah, we see that Neil didn't lose any Pokemon there. Uh, my apologies, my computer was so excited at the focus session reveal that I cut out for a second, so I may have missed some details of this turn. But it, it looks like that Incineroar is a focus session composition, and so it's still on the field now, and and wow, that totally changes the interactions we were discussing. Yes, absolutely, and uh, yeah, I think... Oh man, I mean, with the Dynamax gone for Ben, uh, you know, and presumably a full health uh, Palkia in the back for Neil, um, I think it might be a bit hard. Um, and yeah, no Trick Room setup though, yeah, with Neil having a faster Palkia, but we see a Spatial Ren come out um, over from Bend to knock out the Incineroar, and presumably a Glacial Lance we see being faster over on Bend's uh, Calyrex. Getting that Glacial Lance off is a really big deal, does get some decent damage on the Calyrex, even resisted. Glacial Lance is just so strong. Um, in the meantime, high horsepower going into that Calyrex. Um, one of these Calyrex definitely made a better choice for um, what attack to use in terms of the damage, but I, I'm not actually sure off the top of my head which one. Um, if like Stab, Glacial Lance is more powerful or if the neutral High Horse Power is roughly the same and not huge in this game. Um, but an interesting little interaction there. Right. Um, and I think we were talking about how, you know, Neil has kind of the upper hand because the Palkia is faster on his end, but actually, you know, with Ben's uh, Ready Lucky hanging out in the back, um, I think both of Neil's Pokemon are actually in range for, uh, you know, a you know, a Volt Switch or a Rising Voltage doing the same damage uh, in range for those attacks. So maybe he can try to get at least like one more attack onto the opposing Calyrex because, you know, it got some uh, max quick boost. But otherwise, I think Ben might be able to run away with this. Uh, but we see the Palkia on Neo's end being faster and just knock out Ben before it can uh, get an attack off. Yeah, being able to get rid of that Palkia this time instead of having the max room and be survived really tough, and then that Calyrex being able to set that Trick Room to change oh, the wow. way it comes to play out. I, I made a mistake earlier, and I'll just admit, um, the high horsepower was necessary mm. for the Calyrex, because yes. if you get rid of that Palkia, and the Regilecki comes in before Trick Room is up, suddenly you for sure lose this game, but instead Neil do it being like really forward thinking, and timing exactly when that's set up, to be able to get rid of the Palkia with your Palkia, with, with the speed order being not Trick Room, and then yep. set Trick Room for the thing in the back, that's just a brilliantly navigated Trick Room Mirror there. Brilliant, brilliant. And on the other hand, I think Ben really just could not afford to go for the Protect there. Like, I think he knows that his Calyrex is faster than Neil's Calyrex, and just really had to get to his advantage before the Trick Room went up, get a Glacial Lance into the Palkia, get a High Force out into the Calyrex, 
you know, maybe get a knockout or something, but now that the Trick Room is up, I mean, this Reggie Lecky, you know, another kind of sitting duck situation where it just can't really do anything. It can't attack before either of Neil's Pokemon. Um, so, oh, I guess I was incorrect. Speed that Ben's, tag. maybe it's a speed tie, you're right. Yeah. So, oh, is this going to be enough to knock it out? No! <laughs> Oh, is the Falcon no. still there? Oh, wow! Okay, so the High Horse Power is coming out. Reggie Lucky's gone. If this Palkia can land an attack, then that's the game for Neil. If it can't, then we're playing to a speed tie. Uh, what's <laughs> gonna happen here? I don't know! Did, oh, did no. It, did it go for Flame Guard? Oh, was the Rage is gonna miss? Okay. Wow. Wow, so much just happened in that turn. I was not ready for that. Oh, oh okay. I mean, I think I was like, you know, after your comment on the high horsepower, I was like nervous, like, oh, did I get it wrong with the, you know, the speed order? But I, I think you're right. It was a speed yeah. tie. So that's exactly what happened. But I guess it turns out it really, unfortunately, didn't really matter for Ben. Uh, he needed a critical hit or a better, you know, damage roll to knock out either of, um, either of Neil's Pokemon. And yeah, wow, what a game. I mean, where, where, where should we comment from? There's just so many things that happened. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I do want to just take a second to break down this last turn that happened. It felt yes, like we please. knock over everything. Like the, the Calyrex winning the speed tie so that suddenly you can Glacial Lance. If it had been a high roll on anything, that would have totally changed the game. And then there were two 95% accurate attacks that came out from Neil's side. Uh, so likely to hit, but not guaranteed. There were mm, just mm. so many rolls that went into the single game. Like, yes. even, if you, even if you did win the speed tie with the Calyrex, that doesn't matter because you were just taking get rid of the Alecky. And so the other Calyrex going for that Glacial Lance if it had KO'd the Palkia, that would have been enough. I So just, I was not expecting nearly this close and fast-paced of a match at the end here when I was looking at the teams on paper. I'm just right. really impressed with all the thought that went from both of these players into just a beautiful endgame. Yeah, oh uh, man. I mean, big shout out to what you just said. I, I And I kind of want to bring it up to the point of, like, did Neil counter team... Uh, you know, uh, Ben or not, like, I think that's kind of up in the air, and maybe he can come in the chat if he's here or something, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's just, that first turn in game one was just, like, a shocker, right? Like, I think we both just kind of froze, and we're like, what just happened? Um, and, yeah, I mean, just the fact that he had fake tears on Grimmsnow, it seems so telling that he was prepared to face off against a bulky team coming out from Ben's end, and that really just paid off for him well, and, you know, even though he was so dominant in game one, he still adjusted game two to go with a completely different, uh, you know, strategy, and that still paid off for him well. Like he, uh, he was able to just win two zero here, and you know, kind of, um, you know, finish Ben's win streak to just be the seven games and bring Canada to three zero. So, uh, you know, if he had all that preparation, uh, it definitely came into play, and definitely also his, you know, adjustments in game as well. Not even just before in the prep. The adjustment of game one to game two was brilliant. So uh, really paid off for him well. And I think, you know, Australia is definitely sweating right now. They need to do that four win reverse sweep. Yeah, Canada getting to match point, especially off of such a brilliantly executed game, is just so much momentum to have going into that. Absolutely. I, I want to mention just briefly that you're so right about it being so cool to have the adjustment to game two. I think it was extraordinary to be able to win game one and then leverage a different way of handling a best of mm. keep going with the thing that works keep forcing your opponent to adjust more and more, use the fact that they have to react to what you did before to use a different lead. And it was just, I I was so impressed with the level of Pokemon being played in all three of these sets from all of the players. And I'm just so excited for the next four matches where Australia's really, their back is against the wall, but they're totally capable of coming back. I, wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I want to talk a, a little bit more about like the adjustments, right? Like I think as a beginner or intermediate like VGC player, when you win game one, you think, okay, like that was a really winning play. Uh, you know, there was not too much RNG involved. I think it's a really trustworthy way. I just have the matchup advantage. I'm just going to go for the same thing. And then when you're really playing at the high level that like Neil played, and, uh, you know, even if you do win, you think, okay, you know, there's one way of thinking of like, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But on the other hand, it's like, okay, if I have another option that is still pretty good, like it might not be as, you know, optimal as the first one, if it's still puts me at an advantage and it kind of throws them off in their, you know, in the losing player's uh, adjustment, then it's just a lot smarter to go for that because you just bring a lot more variance to your opponent. They're just not prepared for it. And I think that's what he executed on and just brilliant. So, yeah, I mean, next we have, you know, Alistair Sandover versus Ryan Lestetto, both players that uh, is really known in the VGC community. And it's just, you know, Titan matchup against Titan matchup. Uh, it's just, you know, a revolving door of amazing matches. So, 
Uh, I'm really excited to see what we have next.